we do thank Steve very much for the opportunity that we have to talk about history today to discuss Trenchard and Gordon and their Cato's letters. We ask you to please help this lesson to become meaningful for each of us that we might be able to relate it to ourselves. And we ask you to please help us with these things and ask you to give us an extra portion of thy spirit to enlighten our understandings. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Yeah. Okay, well, um, once again, Wendy, I'm very sorry, but we'll move ahead here, and, and I'm sorry for the late start we're getting. Uh, but, you know, I, I truly, and I know I probably say this every time, <laughs> but I, I'm very excited about our class today um, because Trenchard and Gordon, as I hope you've found, are just uh, so utterly quotable uh, and just so exciting. Um, they really do form a bridge of ideas from the glorious revolution spanning across the temporal and continental divide um, to the American Revolution. Uh, and so I hope we'll be able to see that connection today and understand why these letters written between 1720 and uh, 1723 were, excuse me, so, uh, so influential. Um, let's see, Wendy says, should I mute? Um, I'm, not, I'm not getting any static um, from you, Wendy. So I think, I think as you just listen in, you should be fine. Um, and once again, I do apologize. Okay, as we advance here uh, and learn a little bit more about Trenchard and Gordon. Um, so Trenchard, it's very interesting. It's sort of, uh, they're, they're a motley crew, uh, an interesting mix uh, of, of partners. Trenchard was a rich Englishman, a uh, gentleman and a member of parliament. Uh, he had time to write all, uh, radical political tracts. Uh, he was, in fact, a veteran of the pamphlet wars that occurred during the Glorious Revolution. So, you know, he was writing um, about the same subjects as men like, uh, you know, Milton and Sidney and um, Harrington and Locke. Uh, Gordon um, was much younger, uh, as you can see, um, from uh, the dates of his life. Uh, and he was middle class, as opposed to being a gentleman. Uh, he was quick-witted, uh, had a, a gift for words. He was a Scot. Um, and he uh, went to London after uh, graduating from Aberdeen University uh, and went to London to make a fortune. Both of them met each other, and it was a, a sort of a perfect match. Um, and uh, both of them were able to work so well together because they were deeply committed Commonwealth men. And, and let's, let's take a moment here to get back um, to uh, that idea of the Commonwealth ideology. So what, what do you remember um, about the Commonwealth ideology? Anything come to mind? Wendy, we really need you here. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, let's see. Do you remember anything about what did they say about property or taxes? Uh, liberty. Um, the corruption of the court versus the country. Any any memories? Well, um, isn't it like the the everyone is kind of protected by this? Uh, like everyone protects each other and everything is kind of shared, kind of, or I think that might be what it is. Okay, well let's, let's look here. We have a new and person online today, Mr. Gentile. We do, it's, uh, it's Mr. Caden Caldwell, he's going to sit in yeah. our, our class. Uh, hello Caden, are you with us? He may be having the same problem with his, oh, no. his mic. Oh, maybe that's him there. And Wendy actually typed in something, if you notice. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. It Wendy said here question. that, okay, government is for the good of the common people. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> uh, and I do appreciate the non, uh, the unconventional means by which you're participating. You, you get a, a gold star and a brownie for the day here. <laughs> I wish I could give it to you over the, uh, over the web. Um, so government for the good of the common people. Oh, <laughs> she's mild. Okay, uh, Caden, are you with us? Hello, Caden. Caden, do you hear us? If you can hear us, type in a chat. Let us know. How do I do this right now? Oh, hey. <laughs> Caden, is that you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, welcome, Caden. Uh, Thanks. You're, you're, you're with uh, Heidi and Walter and Wendy, and, and Wendy's unable to speak today um, for some reason, we're not, some technical glitch, but she's typing in some chats. Um, okay, but let's see, uh, Walter and Heidi, uh, you can just say hello to Caden, our new member. Hi, Caden. Hey. Hello. <laughs> okay, okay it, 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 
I have I'm to sorry, admit that? that I have a huh? question about this. This question, yeah. this, what do you remember about? Because I'm sorry to seem so ignorant, but Thanks. what I'm from what Wendy is saying and what I'm remembering is the Commonwealth is more about, like she says, that the government is good for the good of the common people. But the word Commonwealth to me almost has a communistic sound to it, like oh. we're going to share everything. Uh -huh. But it's not that at all, is it? Yeah, no, it's, it's, actually, it's actually probably as far opposite of that as you could get, <laughs> as, okay. as we look here at this, at this quote. Um, and, and but can you see, see how you can look at that word and be confused? Sure. Oh, yeah, well, because you're thinking the common wealth for the common wealth of all, and sharing, share and share alike and all that. I can totally see it. Um, well, here, here's the quote, and Walter, would you read this for us? Sure. The commonwealth ideology led to a fierce occupation with independence. Everything independent on it. The true patriot must think his own thoughts, chart his own course, and be, be held, beholden to no one. Furthermore, he must be a man of property, for property alone could guarantee his personal autonomy. This explained why the Commonwealth men were so distrustful of taxes. The power to tax was the power to take property away the power to destroy independence. Parliament, parliament alone should exercise the power because Parliament alone represented those who would have to pay. There we go. Thank you so much. So as you, as you can see, Wendy, uh, excuse me, Heidi, um, pretty much the opposite of communism in that um, property and personal property uh, was the number one for them. Um, and so communism would definitely not have worked. <laughs> okay, so for, how do they come philosophy. up with the word, how does the word commonwealth how did they come up with that terminology? Um, well, so if, if, you, if you remember back to when we first introduced them, we had a PowerPoint and we looked at the, the definition of a commonwealth. And, and a commonwealth was that ideal form of government in which the people were sovereign, in which there was representation, in which rights were protected, sort of this you know, utopian form of government. Um, and literally, it was that government would work for the common weal or well-being um, of, of its members, meaning that it would be a government by the consent of the governed where the people will be able to protect their natural rights, not, not hold, common in, not hold uh, property in common. I mean, you can see how we've been so indoctrinated that I can't even hardly look at that word, even though I know I'm thinking, okay, commonwealth for the people that really wanted independence, but yet mm -hmm. it's making me feel like, and, and I think people are confused even today what it means to have mm -hmm. a commonwealth. They think it needs to have wealth in common. Right. Yeah, but no, this, this is, yeah, that's right. This, I mean, this is the 17th century definition of, of commonwealth that, that these men were, were talking about here, uh, which is very important to make that distinction. Uh, well, as we, as we talk about here, you know, there's some interesting, uh, I, I, have, I have two, two books that I'm quoting here that I think will provide a window into sort of these commonwealth men of the 18th century, so from the 1700s. So we're not talking about, uh, you know, Locke or Milton or Harry, uh, Sidney or Harrington, you know, here we're talking about men like Trenchard and Gordon. And I, I love this quote. Uh, Caden, would you read it for us? Yeah. The colonists identified themselves with 17th century heroes of liberty such as Milton, Harrington, Sidney, and Locke. But they felt closer to the early 18th century uh, writers who modified and enlarged this earlier body of ideas, fused it into a whole with, with other contemporary strains of thought, and above all, applied it to the problems of 18th century English politics. Okay, and then the quote continues here. Heidi, would you read that for us? These early 18th century writers, coffeehouse radicals, and opposition politicians, spokesmen for the anti-court independence and the country vision of English politics, more than any other group of writers, shaped the mind of the American revolutionary generation. To the colonists, the most important of these publicists and intellectual middlemen were those spokesmen for extreme libertarianism, John Trenchard and Thomas Horton. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then uh, <laughs> to finish the quote here, um, Walter, would you read this for us? Sure. Thanks. Trenchard and Gordon, Gordon left an incredible imprint on the country. Mind everywhere country, mind everywhere in the English-speaking world in America where they were republished entire or in part again and again quoted from every colonial newspaper from Boston to Savannah and referred to repeatedly in the 
to in the pamphlet literature, the writings of Trenchard and Gordon ranked with the treatises of uh, Locke as the most author authoritative statement of the nature of pol political liberty, and above Locke as an exposition of the social sources of threats they faced. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if you were familiar with Trenchard and Gordon and Cato's letters before today, uh, but hopefully you'll leave this class with um, a great love for them and an appreciation of just how influential they were. Uh, if you look at this here, and I, I have a second witness coming in a moment, so you don't have to take Bernard Balin's word for it, but you know he says here that um, they ranked with Locke uh, as the most authoritative statement on the nature of political liberty, and even above Locke, this is to the American Revolutionary Generation, right? as an exposition of the social sources of the threats which they faced. And so these men um, wrote something that was immensely popular. We'll, we'll talk about why. But just in case you don't believe Balin, I want to go here to the second witness. This will be Robert Middlecoff here. Uh, and I'll read the first one. The 18th century Commonwealth men have not survived as great names. Uh, for example, you know, I, I, I'm inserting here, you know, we, we don't uh, maybe quote them as much as we do Locke. You know, but in the fashioning of revolutionary ideology in America, they had an influence that surpassed Locke's. To be sure, they drew upon Locke and others more original than themselves. Indeed, their ideas were not original, and the heart of their political theory resembled closely the great Whig consensus of the century. These ideas were so widely shared in England as to be conventional, but the 18th century radicals, meaning the Commonwealth men, like Trenchard and Gordon, put them to unconventional uses. While English Whigs and English governments sang the praises of English institutions, English history, and English liberty, the radicals chanted hymns of mourning, dirges for the departing liberty of England, and the rising corruption in English politics and society. And then, uh, Heidi, would you finish the quote for us? This, this is a great quote. Within all states, from ancient Rome to the present, they argued, there had been attempts to enslave the people. The history of politics was nothing other than the history of the struggle between power and liberty. Cato's letters likened power to fire. It warms, scorches, or destroys according as it is watched, provoked, or increased. It is as dangerous as it is useful. It is apt to break its bounds. OK. That's from the glorious cause, um, Robert Middlecoff. So what do, we, what do we think about these men so far? Uh, this is quite the introduction. I have a question. <laughs> Mr. Gentile, sure. I have a question for you. Yes. yes. Um, did you teach this exact same stuff at your school in Boston? Uh, did I teach? No. I, I, well, actually, when I was in Boston, um, I was teaching um, ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. So I wasn't actually teaching. But this, this, is, this is more of my specialty. Um, and actually, hold on. W Wendy has also written, too. Um, did that answer your question, Heidi? Well, I'm just thinking, how could people hear this and not realize the connection that it makes to today? Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, if your school that you taught at was so liberal, aren't these boys hearing this and realizing the vast difference between what these men thought and what's going on today in government? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting because they, they would focus on a different, and, and Wendy, I will get to your, uh, your, your, your chats. Hold on. Don't, don't, don't feel I've forgotten you. Um, but, um, you know, it's interesting because uh, my, my friends in Massachusetts, perhaps, uh, would have focused on the part here that talks about how it uh, is dangerous as it is useful. Um, and they would have focused on how you know, big government can be so useful and that, sure, we have to you know, make sure it doesn't spill over. But for them, it's not spilling over. It's not scorching oh. anything else. It's, it's still in the <laughs> fire ring. Um, and so, okay. so it's just sort of a matter of perspective. <laughs> now, now, Wendy okay. has some great chats in here. And I want to no, hold on. There we go. OK. Um, let me go back here to the beginning. Um, and so Wendy first said, wasn't there a play about Cato that was famous at the time, too? Um, and yes, there was. Actually, C Cato was a very popular figure. Um, he was um, the sort of arch rival of Julius Caesar um, and a diehard Republican uh, in Rome uh, who wanted to work for the Republic instead of uh, the Empire. Um, and so it has been often seen and used as a symbol of, of liberty in the face of tyranny. Um, and then, let's see here, we also have another one. Uh, Wendy said they mourned 
um, the loss of liberty after 1689 in England, a question mark. Um, and yes, they did, because it's interesting. Um, as, you, as you might have noticed in these, in these quotes, there's something here very subtle. It's the, it's the court versus the country. Uh, and this was what the English in the 18th century, like Trenchard and Gordon, would say about corruption. They would have said that you have um, the closer you are to power, the closer you are to the king, the closer you are to the deciding bodies in parliament, the more you can have sort of the, the darkened room type of politics going on where uh, deals are done that are um, illegal and there's graft and there's corruption. And the closer you are to the court, as they would say, um, the less uh, virtuous you would be. And so politics, they said, really had to be a grassroots movement of the people as much as possible. And in terms of the people's representatives, they needed to represent the country mentality of the people who were distanced from the corruption of power. Um, and so government should be um, as little as possible um, and as detached from the corruption of the court as possible in order to be most effective and most um, efficient in protecting people's natural liberties. Uh, and so, yes, they did, they did feel that, yes, we, we had won lots of liberty uh, with the triumph of consent of the governed over the, the king, um, but there was still more that could be done to purge England of any remaining corruption at the center of its power, the court. Does that answer your question, Wendy? Okay, great. Well, um, and once again, I, you know, I, I really do apologize for the late start um, that we've gotten here, um, so we're going to try to move move a little bit with uh, with with speed. Okay. Um, so Trenchard and Gordon, just a little background. So from 1719, you know, they wrote this weekly newspaper called the Independent Whig, which was very popular in Britain. Um, and then um, from 1720 to 1723, they published Cato's Letters, which were first um, little serials that would appear in the London Journal. Uh, and then they were published in book form, both in London and they sold like hotcakes in the colonies. Um, colonists absolutely loved them in America. And so let's find out why. So the overarching reasoning, reasoning question that I have for us today is uh, those of you who, who've been able to read Trenchard and Gordon, those two letters, number 15 and the number 62, you know, why do you think that Trenchard and Gordon's letters were so popular in the colonies? I wish I would have read them. <laughs> I, I need to get the copy. Or okay. Or, you might have already given it to me. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I mailed it to you, but that's okay. We, oh. we can, we can go over the sources. Come, come see me after a class. All right. Okay. Uh, what about Walter or Heidi um, or Wendy via a chat? Well, and honestly, I, I really didn't get time to read them either. But just looking at them really quickly, I mean, okay. I read like the first couple of paragraphs. Okay. Um, and I know that they talk so much about freedom. At least the first one, so much about freedom of speech. Mm hmm And I guess they just, I mean, they, well, it's kind of what. Yeah, it's kind of what Wendy's writing here. Yeah, okay. So you can, can you can see what Wendy's writing too. Excellent. Yeah, the fact. Yeah, she's it's because it's to all. Oh, good. Good. See that where it says to all? That means we all see it. You can actually okay. choose just to have it go to one person, or you can choose to have it go to everyone. Oh. But anyway, yeah, the fact that they can actually speak up for and tell and say what they agree or disagree with. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and Wendy, thank you for pointing that out. You know, the freedom to complain about King George, right? Um, this, this sort of reminds me of Huck Finn, where you have uh, the two uh, uh, imposters there, the Duke, and then I can't remember the name of the other guy who pretends that he's dumb, and, and the Duke speaks for the, the man who can't speak. <laughs> anyway, so here, here, reading uh, for Wendy, right? The freedom to complain about King George um, is so true, right? It would apply exactly to their situation. We want freedom of speech because we don't like what's going on, so we want to be able to say that we don't like it. Thank you so much. What about you, Walter, uh, in, in your reading of Trenchard and Gordon? Why were they so popular? Well, um, they just talk so much about uh, liberty and freedom, and um, I mean, a lot of these other people did too, but just, um, well, like uh, was already said, uh, freedom of speech, and so they were able to um, uh, complain about King George, and they were that would probably have implied that they would have uh, had uh, been able to be uh, send representatives to Parliament. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
Yeah, no, thank you for that. You know, uh, I think it's interesting because if you were to think of the audience to whom Trenchard and Gordon were writing, what would you say that audience was? Who are they trying to reach? Oh, I have no idea. I thought these letters were to each other. They weren't? Uh, no. Nope. So they, they, were published, uh, they were published in newspapers um, to start with. And so basically, if you think about um, Locke, right, I mean, he's writing this political treatise, okay, for other philosophers um, to justify um, his sort of five states and to talk about the glorious revolution and, and what's happening here, people could change their own government, that sort of thing. You know, he's not writing to the common man. He's writing to other intellectuals. Hmm. Now, as, as you read Trenchard and Gordon, do you think they're writing to other intellectuals? Well, the first thing I noticed is that it seemed a lot easier to read than some of the other. Yeah. So I think you they're writing it. more to just the common man. That's right, and, and, and that's, exact, that's exactly who they're writing to. They're writing to the common man. Uh, Wendy says, we Englishmen, right? They share this bond together. Um, and so, yes, you know, let's talk about liberty together. Let's talk about it on a level that everybody can understand so we can be free together and protect our rights together and work for more rights together if they're not protected. Uh, and so, you know, I think here uh, there's a, I have a dis an interesting... Uh, relating question that, unfortunately, just for the sake of time, I don't want to spend too much time on. But in brief, right, what lesson about communication could we learn from Cato's letters if we were to sort of relate that to our own communication? But you have to totally tailor it to who's your audience. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Yeah, no, that, that's exactly what I mean. Thanks so much, Heidi. You know, truly, I mean, oh, and, and Wendy says, you know, make them accessible to as many people as possible. That's right. If you have a great idea, right, do you stick it under a basket so nobody can find out about it, right? You know, let your light so shine before men, right? We're not supposed to put that light under a bushel. Okay, and so, yeah, they, that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to make it as accessible uh, to as many people as possible. Um, well, okay, now, now we're going to get into these letters, and, and so I'm not sure how much um, of them have, uh, have been read, but I, I'm, I'm excited about them, and I hope we'll have some rich discussions. Um, so if we reason here from letter 15, that's the first one, freedom of speech, um, how is the extent of good government, excuse me, sorry, um, the, uh, my little thing was in the way, there we go, now I can see it. Okay, how is the extent of freedom of speech in a state, uh, <coughs> excuse me, how is the extent of freedom of speech in a state a good gauge of the overall amount of liberty <coughs> protected by a state? <coughs> Excuse me. I think maybe if, if there's freedom of speech, I think in a way it kind of keeps the government in check, knowing that the people, if they have a problem with something, can you know, announce that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Right? So if there's a problem, um, <coughs> excuse me, there's a frog in my throat. If there's a problem and then we have government not letting anybody speak about it. Well, okay, obviously there's not a lot, a lot, not a lot of liberty in that state, but yet if you're free to talk about it, right, it's a, it's a good overall gauge. Now, uh, Wendy said that there's a direct correlation between the amount of freedom of speech that you have uh, and the amount of liberty overall that's protected um, by a government. Um, Heidi, what would you say about that? Well, I... In the little bit I did get to glance over this letter, I loved mm -hmm. the fourth paragraph mm -hmm. because it just reminds me so much of this fairness doctrine thing that's being talked about right now. And, and I'll read this just so that everybody, in case not everybody's on the same page, but it says that men ought to speak well of their governors is true, while their governors deserve to be well spoken of. But to do public mischief without hearing of it is only the prerogative and felicity of tyranny. Mm. A free people will be showing that they are so by their freedom of speech. Yes, thank you. And I just love that because, I mean, put in there any other thing besides governor, too, whoever it is that's um, your leader at the time, and it's almost like you're not allowed to say anything bad mm -hmm. because you're, you're called names if you do. Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. love the way that even back then they were saying, no, you speak well of someone if what they're doing is right. And if they're not speaking, if they're not doing the right thing and you just let it go, it's tyranny. That's right. Yeah, thank you so, so much. I just you know, love I, that. I just thought it was very well written. 
Yes, yes, no, th and, th and thank you for pointing that out for us. That was on page 48. Uh, and w Wendy, Wendy said here, you know, where a man can't call his tongue his own, he can't, he can, uh, he can scarcely, he can scarce call anything else his own. And mm. excuse me for my stumbling in reading that, Wendy. Um, but you know, what what a great point, right? Um, you think about we go back and back and back and back to this. You know, James Madison, principle number four. You know, conscience is the most sacred of all property. It's so true, and really. Our tongue merely tells other people what our conscience feels, right? right. What we think. Now, I'm wondering so, where Wendy got that quote. That's a great quote. It, it is a great quote. Wendy, would you like Wendy, to can enlighten you just us? Type in there where oh, you second paragraph. Oh, the second there we go. Paragraph. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. It's from, so. it's from Drenchard and Gordon. Okay. <laughs> now we second know paragraph. Quote. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I think it's interesting because um, if we look. At the uh, page 49, excuse me, sorry, uh, page page 50, page 50, Trenchard and Gordon say that this is the third paragraph. Freedom of speech is the great bulwark of liberty. They prosper and die together, and it is the terror of traitors and oppressors and a barrier against them. It produces excellent writers and encourages men of fine genius, and it, it goes on. Um, and so, what, what do we think about that? That freedom of speech is the great bulwark or guard, wall, defensive structure of liberty. They prosper and die together. <laughs> no, I, I think it's pretty powerful. I mean, it makes you realize how important it is to guard that right. If they're saying they, how exactly did they say it? Um, they prosper and die together? Mm -hmm. That's pretty powerful. Okay. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and I love it too, on page 48 it says, freedom of speech is ever the symptom, last paragraph, as well as the effect of good government. The symptom and the effect of good government. Uh, well, let's, let's move on here. Just um, We've got lots of other things here. I have an interesting quote that I wanted to share with you. You may be familiar with this. Um, here's the quote, um, and uh, Caden, would you read this for us? Yeah. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. The question in every case is whether the words used are used in such circumstan circumstances and are of, are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the, subs the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, so here we have a quote. This is a... Uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, uh, writing his decision on the Schenck versus the United States case, case in 1919. And so as we think about this, right, I mean, freedom of speech, you know, you know okay, we're thinking, yeah, it's a great thing, it's a great thing, it's a great thing. Okay, but, it, I mean, is there ever a line, right? And he's saying here in this decision that there is a line. So, for example, if a man falsely shouts fire in a theater full of people and causes panic, right, and causes people to be trampled, Right now, why is shouting fault? Why is falsely, <laughs> okay, shouting fire in a theater? Why would you say that that perhaps goes so far? And what do Trenchard and Gordon say about that in terms of if there is a line to draw? I would, you know, I, I haven't read the letters, but I would say that this kind of this is affecting everyone else's kind of right to life in a sense. You know, this when you shout fire causes people to kind of go uneasy. So I think that. Freedom of speech is allowed so long as it doesn't affect anyone else's rights. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I mean that, and people would say, "Well, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody here, but there's, you know, there's been a homosexual movement, and I wonder if, uh, if the freedom to speech is infringed by fear of giving offense, and that's, for me, that's wrong. You don't, you don't stop, you don't not talk because you're scared of offending somebody. You speak your conscience, mm -hmm. um, but if you're not affecting anyone else's rights, then you should be able to talk as much as you want. But the moment that it affects someone else's rights, that that's when it, um, that's the line should be drawn. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for that. You know, and, and Wendy said here, uh, she has a quote: "As far as it, as far as by it, he hurts not the society or any member of it." Right. And so, which is exactly what you were saying, Caden. Uh, and then also in the very first paragraph of the of the letter 15, right, talks about how um, as far as by it, he does not hurt and control the right of another, and this is the only check which it ought to suffer, the only bounds which it, meaning freedom of speech, ought to know. Can you tell me um, where you're that? Uh, what was, oh, that was the very first paragraph uh, of the letter 15 on page 48. 
Okay. Great. And, and I love how Wendy points out here, you know, good point, Caden, offense is not harm, right? There's a difference between uh, perhaps offending someone because they get their feelings hurt and imposing a clear and present danger like shouting fire falsely in a theater would cause where there have been um, <laughs> instances where people have done that and then um, there have been uh, tramplings. There was one in, in Italy once. There was one early in the century uh, in the United States where somebody did that trying to see what would happen, you know, sort of as a joke, and um, children were trampled and, and killed because of that. So no, there's, there's a line, right? So thank you for pointing that out. Well, if we, if we go on here, um, let's see. Okay. It will advance. I know it will. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Another quote here. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this already, but this is from, from Trenchard and Gordon, letter 15. Quote, only the wicked governors of men dread what is said of them. So how can you apply this quote to yourself? Well, if you're doing something bad or wicked, you don't want other people talking about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You just want everyone to be quiet and not notice. Mm -hmm. But if right. no one re I mean, this, I went on, I don't know if this is crossing the line, but I went on mission splits yesterday. Um, yep. I'm, I'm, all right, so I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a member of the LDS Church. I don't know if anyone, anyone else here is, but I went on mission splits yesterday, and we um, we kind of we were talking a little bit about how um, we were trying to make sure that these these members were reading the scriptures and stuff. But I was I didn't really want to say much because you know I, I I'm not one to point fingers and judge, but there's an extent where you need to look at your fellow men and say. Look, I am a hypocrite, but you could be doing better here. And so when it comes to governments, if, if the government's not being constantly checked by the people, then the government's going to continue to do things wrong. And, they're, and, and it's just, there's got to be a balance, you know, and if, if there's no freedom of speech, then how is, how is that, how is what the people think um, implemented? Yeah, you know? no, thank you. You know, and... And uh, Wendy ta tags onto that by saying, you know, I should love for people to talk about what I really do, <laughs> right? Shouldn't we have nothing to hide, right? I mean, yeah. shouldn't we feel that whatever we're doing is worthy to be scrutinized? And, hey, if it is scrutinized, well, so be it, because I feel fine with it, right? Right. Um, and, yeah, if we, can, if we can be better, what do we have to fear? We should be better. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, Okay, and so here now this this is interesting. Um, can you have I, and if you ha if you haven't read it, I'm not sure this this may be a difficult question. But um, if you've read it, right, what is Trenchard and Gordon's definition of liberty? Uh, if you go to fifty page fifty one, um, bottom paragraph on fifty one, and then going over to fifty two, they talk about liberty here, and I just think it is interesting to to look at their definition. Um, Walter, would you like to read that for us? By liberty, I understand. Which page again? Uh, this is the bottom of 51. I have okay. it if you'd like me to read it. Oh, oh sure, Heidi. Did you find it, Walter? Uh, yes, I have found it. Okay, go ahead then. Okay. By liberty, I understand the power which every man has over his own actions and his right to enjoy the fruit of his labor, art, and industry as far as by it he hurts no, not the society or any members of it by okay. taking Let's from... We'll, we'll, we'll stop there. So if we see this here, uh, two parts to their definition of liberty. What are the two parts? Uh, the power you have over your own actions yep, and so your own the fruit of your own labor. And, and how, how would we summarize that, perhaps? Hmm. Well, actually, to me, there's more than two parts, because then it also goes oh. as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. No, I, I like that too. Um, definitely, you know, it's interesting because, um, and w Wendy said income for that. Uh, on, the, on page 52, they go uh, here and they say it again. And uh, at the very end of the paragraph, Trench and Gordon say that every man is the sole lord and arbiter or judge of his own one private actions and two property. So for them, sort of, you can think of private actions and property. You know. Um, as those things that hopefully liberty will be able to um, to protect, and a character of which no man living can divest him, but by usurpation or his own consent, right? And so, and where uh, is liberty, that that you're reading from? Oh, that that was on 52. 
uh, just the, that very top paragraph that spills over from 51. Okay. Um, and just, just for the sake of time today, and I, I'm sorry that we have less time to go deeper here, but I, there are a couple things I want to make sure we get to. Um, you know, we're, we're going to skip this one about Trenchard and Gordon's ideas being similar to Locke's. Um, there's a lot on page 52 about it. It just sort of goes through the, the, five, um, the five big ideas of Locke. Um, this one we've actually talked about before. Uh, the love of liberty is beyond the love of life. Um, and we talked about as a class how, um, sure, there certainly are things that you know, we'd be willing to stand, but stand up for to the point of even being willing to die for. Right? And we talked about sort of you know, faith and family um, and liberty. Hmm. And then uh, what, I, what I want to spend the balance of our time um, here is on this. It's a paragraph on page. This is from letter 62, page 55. And this paragraph, honestly, r read it again and again and again. It has so many gems to be mined from it. It's unbelievable. Uh, let's let's look at it together. Page 55. This is letter 62 here, and it's the second paragraph that starts. Indeed, liberty. Heidi, would you read that for us? Yes. Indeed, liberty is the divine source of all human happiness. To possess in security the effects of our industry is the most powerful and reasonable incitement to be industrious. And to be able to provide for our children and to leave them all that we have is the best motive to beget them. But where property is precarious, labor will languish. The privileges of thinking, saying, and doing what we please and of growing as rich as we can without any other restriction than that by all this we hurt not the public nor one another are the glorious privileges of liberty and its effects to live in freedom, plenty, and safety. Woohoo! Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, great. so Boy, much that. there. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's talk about it. What are they what are they saying? Can you reason? What are they saying? There's so much in there. I love the I love the uh, and and the growing as rich as we can and not so much because I feel like money should be where we place all of our time and effort. I don't, I don't believe it should be. I think serving the Lord should be. But as far as people talking about how evil rich people are, and so they better start giving everybody else more of their money, I just completely disagree with that philosophy. Yeah. So I love what he says here. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and let's see here. That our motive is to help our families, you know, mm -hmm. and if everybody would be more motivated. And then also, what does it say here as far as, and when we're, when we, well, property is precarious. Labor will languish. I just love that too. Yeah, yeah. There, that that there's a lot to be said. In fact, in fact, let's relate that here. There's that quote where property is precarious, labor will languish. Um, and I love uh, Wendy said here. This celestial world needs a profit motive. Very interesting. Thank you for that, Wendy. That insight. Um, how can you relate this quote to a command economy like communism, where the government commands or controls? Okay, versus a market economy like capitalism, um, where sort of you have free market um, supply and demand and uh, that sort of thing. So how, how do you, what do you, what do you, what do you see in this quote about either communism versus capitalism and, and liberty and how they're connected? And okay, um, well, there's, someone once said that um, forced charity isn't charity. Mm -hmm. That was Ezra Taft Benson. And so I think, um, you know, it, we're, we're in the, when we're in the service of our fellow men, we're in the service of our God, and that brings true happiness. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about communism, I think of force and how you're forcing people to be equal. Mm -hmm. And it steals the incentive to be charitable. It steals the, it steals the ability to really be happy because mm -hmm. you're kind of forced to be equal. You're forced to be happy. You know, It's, just, it's kind of contradicting itself. But um, when I think of capitalism, you know, there's, there's so much liberty there where people... Um, take what they can do and they create value for people mm -hmm. and I feel like um, you know true happiness does does lie in live does lie in liberty because that's you know that's the first thing we fought for was our agency mm -hmm. and it's just interesting how people are trying to take that away and, and force us to be equal you know and so yeah. I, no thank you for that well, you know yeah. and it's interesting too because think about it is there more of an incentive to work when your hard work can actually be rewarded in proportion to how much you work? Or yeah. if you're just sitting at a stool all day and you're just going to get something from the government no matter how much work you do, whether you slough off for 12 hours or you put your nose to the grindstone for 12 hours. Where's the incentive? I mean, where, where's the greater incentive? Right, right. 
But I've got to clarify, clarify myself real quick. I, I was talking about equality. I believe that we're all equal before the law and before God, but that doesn't mean we have equal things and stuff. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I mean when it comes mm -hmm. to equal, when it comes to like money and, and possessions. We're not equal there, but we are equal before the law and before God. But okay, th thank you for that clarification. You know, yeah, but what, what do you think? Walter, what do you think about that? Would you have more incentive to work if someone was going to pay you for how much you did and that property would then be yours by earning it? Or if it didn't matter how much you did, if you put out 27 shelves in a day or if you put out one and you get exactly the same, which one gives you more incentive to work? Well, I think if you would have to, um, if you would have to uh, work instead of just slough off, I think you would have to. Uh, you would have a greater incentive to work and try your hardest. You know, I've got an I have an experience to share. There was a teacher who wanted to implement communism kind of in his classroom and see if it really works. Mm -hmm. So what he did is he said, "All right, um, we're going to average the grades." We're going to take those who get D's and those who get A's. We're going to equalize so everyone's going to get about a B. Mm -hmm. And so the people who work really hard studied and everything they did what they usually do, and they took the test, and they got A's. And then the people who don't study, who usually get D's, you know, got the same score, and he took them and he put them together, and everyone got about a B. Mm -hmm. And then the next time they did this, everyone got about a C. Then the next time they were at a D, and then the next time they were all at F's because no one had incentive to work. Because they were gonna, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're going to be equalized with everybody else. That's right. That's so right. If you're, if you're not going to be rewarded for your point? effort, yeah. why put in the effort? Right. Right. There's if no it's incentive. Not that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, thank you so much. And can, can I say, folks, we, we could spend so much time talking about this. And, you know, we had some technical glitches today uh, that really slowed us up at the beginning. But um, can I just uh, make an invitation for you to consider... Uh, these things at home, just talk about them with your families. Think about them. Reread Trenchard and Gordon uh, and read it if you didn't get it, a chance to read it all the way through. Uh, truly, there's just so much here um, to, to digest and to chew on and, and to hopefully find inspiring. Um, and, and the American Revolutionary Generation certainly did. They looked back to Trenchard and Gordon, uh, like those quotes said, you know, uh, in many ways as even being a lock in terms of their influence uh, because of the way they spoke to the common man about liberty. Um, and about its sources, and about how to protect it. Um, well, our time's up for today. I have to, uh, to run out. Um, but Wendy, thanks so much for your participation. I know it was um, sort of under duress today um, through uh, the means which, by which you had to do it. And uh, thanks everybody else, Walter and Heidi and Caden. Grateful to have you with us. And uh, mm -hmm. I look forward to the tutorials tomorrow. And then I look forward to our class on Monday. All right, so thank take you. Take care, everybody. Thank All right. you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>